October 24th, 1593, Manila. A Spanish soldier named Gil Perez stands guard outside the governor's palace. High has been on duty for hours, exhausted, sleep deprived, running on nothing but adrenaline and duty. He leans against a wall. Just for a moment, his eyelids close. When he opens them, the geometry of reality has shifted. He is no longer in Manila. He is in Mexico City. Gil Perez has just traveled 9,000 miles in less time than it takes to blink. And here's the disturbing part. It isn't science fiction. This is documented history, written by Antonio de Morga in 1609, by Gaspar de San Agustin in 1698. Perez stood trial before the Spanish Inquisition. They imprisoned him for desertion and possibly for dealings with the devil. Two months later, a galleon arrives from Manila. It confirms everything the exact date, the exact circumstances. Passengers on that ship recognize Perez. They saw him in Manila the day before he appeared in Mexico. The authorities have no choice. They release him, send him home. But the strangest part? His story isn't unique. What if cases like this weren't anomalies? What if history is full of spontaneous teleportations, dismissed as myth, madness, or miracles? And what if, in September 2025, scientists at Kyoto University made a discovery that suddenly makes these events unsettlingly plausible? Here's the part nobody is prepared for. Gil Perez wasn't an outlier. His case wasn't a historical glitch or a miracle or a folk tale that accidentally wandered into official records. It was a symptom. One data point in a pattern big enough to span continents, centuries, cultures. Most people never hear these stories because they live in the wrong places. In dusty archives, forgotten police reports, local folklore, military transcripts that were never meant to be public. But once you start pulling on the thread, the whole thing begins to unravel. Take this one. Karlovy Vary, Czech Republic. A boy goes out to play. He takes one step, literally one, and vanishes. Hours later, nine kilometers away, he's found wandering in shock. No roads between those points match his description. No possible path. No time for the distance. And when asked what happened, he says something so simple it should be impossible. I lifted my foot, and I was somewhere else. Or consider this Spain, 1974. A soldier named Carlos Mireles is standing guard. Witnesses watch him. He's at his post. He's visible, present, real. And then he isn't. No scream, no flash, no footsteps, just gone. Two hours later, he's found miles away, shivering, eyes unfocused, saying he fell through something that felt like ice and landed in a completely different place. Medical tests show nothing. No trauma, no injury, nothing to explain where he went or how he got there. And these aren't isolated oddities. Historians never talk about it. But if you dig through the right documents, you start to see it. Cases from Russia, India, Brazil, France, Japan, children, monks, farmers, soldiers, people who had no connection to each other, no shared language, no shared mythology, all describing the exact same phenomenon. Not travel, not movement, transition, a sudden collapse of location, like the universe briefly stopped caring where they were supposed to be. Here's the part that should unsettle you. Most of these people didn't want their stories known. Many were punished for telling them. Some were imprisoned, some institutionalized. Some vanished a second time, permanently. Yet the accounts persist. And when you lay them side by side, you see something scientists ignored for centuries. They follow rules. They cluster under the same conditions, extreme fatigue, momentary dissociation, a brief loss of sensory grounding, a flash, a fall, a blink, and a new location. 
not because they moved through space, but because space, for one impossible moment, moved around them. And here's the pivot. For centuries, these stories sounded like hallucinations or miracles until now. Because in September 2025, something happened in a physics lab in Kyoto that forces us to reconsider every one of these cases, not as legends, but as early, poorly understood examples of a phenomenon we're only just beginning to measure. The impossible stories stayed the same. Reality changed around them. Einstein hated quantum mechanics. Not because he didn't understand it. He understood it better than almost anyone. He hated it because it suggested something obscene. That reality at its deepest level doesn't make sense. That particles separated by the entire width of the universe could somehow remain connected, influencing each other instantly. With no signal passing between them, he called it spooky action at a distance. He meant it as an insult, a reductio ad absurdum. He was essentially saying, look, if you believe this quantum nonsense, you have to believe in magic and magic doesn't exist. Therefore, quantum mechanics must be incomplete. In 1935, Einstein and two colleagues published what became known as the EPR paradox a thought experiment designed to expose quantum mechanics as either incomplete or insane, they were betting on incomplete. They lost that bet. In the 1960s, a physicist named John Bell devised a test. Not a thought experiment, a real, measurable test that could settle the question once and for all, is the universe sane and local? Or is it genuinely as strange as quantum mechanics suggests? Experiments ran, again and again. Different labs, different decades, different countries. Every single one confirmed the same thing. Einstein was wrong. The universe really is that strange. Particles separated by any distance, across a room, across a galaxy, remain connected. Change one, the other responds, instantly. No signal, no mechanism we can observe. The connection just exists. And once scientists accepted that this spooky connection was real, a wild question emerged. If information can be shared instantly across any distance, can we use that to move things? The answer came in 1997, the first quantum teleportation of a photon. Not science fiction, not theory, actual teleportation. A photon's quantum state was scanned, destroyed at point A, and perfectly reconstructed at point B using entanglement as the bridge. The information traveled the photon itself. It never moved. It was annihilated and reborn. And that process, scan, destroy, rebuild, that became the template. But here's where the field stayed stuck for decades. We could only teleport a single particle at a time, a lone unit. Impressive, sure, but utterly useless for anything complex, anything real, because nothing in the real world is a single particle. You're not one particle. A chair isn't one particle. Even a virus is a cathedral of billions. To teleport something real, you'd need to transfer not just particles, but their relationships, the structure, the invisible architecture binding them into a coherent whole. And that's exactly the wall quantum teleportation hit for years, until this September. Scientists at Kyoto University published something almost nobody noticed. They solved a 25-year-old problem, how to reliably measure and manipulate W-state entanglement, a form of quantum connection involving multiple particles at once. They didn't teleport a whole object, but they demonstrated a key ingredient, the ability to work with entangled systems, not just isolated particles. It's the difference between moving a single brick and learning how the blueprint of an entire wall could one day be transferred intact. And here's the part no one says out loud. 
If you can capture the pattern of relationships in a system, then scale becomes an engineering challenge, not a theoretical one. Because that's all a body ever is, all any object is. Not the atoms themselves, but the pattern those atoms temporarily inhabit. Atoms flow, swap, decay, renew. What persists is the configuration. And if a configuration can be measured, if it can be transmitted, then in principle, the material substrate doesn't matter. The arrangement could be rebuilt anywhere. Quantum teleportation never moved matter. It moved information, a blueprint. The original state is consumed in the measurement. The new one rises elsewhere, a perfect reconstruction, a perfect absence, which leads to a question you cannot escape. If your atoms were scanned, erased, and rebuilt somewhere else, same structure, new matter, would that still be you? And that's exactly where things get strange. You're already teleporting, right now, all the time. Your brain doesn't perceive reality continuously. It updates your conscious experience about six times per second between those updates, darkness, gaps, nothing. You exist as a series of discrete moments stitched together so smoothly, you experience them as continuous, but they're not. You're blinking in and out of existence six times per second, and you never notice because memory fills the gaps. Each moment, you're a slightly different configuration, different atoms, different neural patterns, different person, technically. Identity is an illusion maintained by pattern continuity. And now we return to the question we left hanging, not because it's dramatic, but because it's unavoidable. If they could scan you, teleport you, and rebuild you atom for atom somewhere else, would that still be you? Your atoms would be different, literally new matter. But the pattern would be identical. Same memories, same personality, same sense of I. Would you be dead or relocated? Here's where it gets interesting. Some quantum physicists think consciousness itself might be quantum, not just running on quantum hardware, but exhibiting quantum properties. Superposition, entanglement, non-locality. If that's true, then consciousness isn't generated by the brain, it's accessed by it. The brain is less like a computer generating awareness and more like a radio tuning into a signal that exists independently which means teleportation wouldn't move your consciousness. It would just change which physical system is tuned to your particular frequency. Here's the part that changes everything. Ancient cultures understood something we're only now rediscovering. Dzogchen, an ancient Tibetan Buddhist practice, has a teaching. The body follows awareness where consciousness places itself. That's where you are. Location is a setting, not a fact. Yogic traditions talk about siddhis, paranormal abilities achieved through meditation. One of them is literally called instantaneous travel. Not metaphorical, they mean appearing somewhere else. Christian mysticism has dozens of documented cases of bilocation, saints being seen in two places simultaneously. Padre Pio, the 20th century Italian priest, has multiple verified accounts of appearing to people hundreds of miles away, while witnesses confirm he never left his monastery. Hallucinations, collective delusion, or maybe consciousness under certain conditions can do things physics is only now starting to model. And here's the twist. For the last five years, quantum mechanics has started sounding like mystical texts. Not because physics has become less rigorous, but because it's gotten rigorous enough to describe what mystics were trying to point at all along non-locality. Observer effect. Collapse of superposition through measurement. These aren't metaphors anymore. They're mathematical realities that just happen to sound like Zen koans. 
Maybe the mystics weren't describing supernatural events. Maybe they were describing natural events that we didn't have the science to understand yet. Events where consciousness interacts with reality in ways that violate our intuition, but not apparently the actual laws of physics. Think about Gil Perez again, exhausted, dissociated, leaning against a wall in Manila. What if in that moment of extreme fatigue, his consciousness did something quantum mechanics says is theoretically possible, even if improbable? What if the observer in the quantum sense momentarily lost coherence and the system, his body, his location, jumped to a different valid state? I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying the physics we now understand makes it less impossible than it seemed. Let's be honest. We've been trying to figure this out forever. Philosophy, religion, mysticism, they're all asking the same question. What am I really? And now quantum physics, the most rigorous, mathematical, skeptical discipline we have, has arrived at the same place and is shrugging. We don't know either, but it seems like you're made of information and location might be negotiable. There's a moment in every scientific revolution where the facts stop being the problem. The problem becomes what the facts imply quantum teleportation of systems non-local information, patterns that survive the loss of matter, consciousness behaving like something that doesn't fully belong to space. Individually, these discoveries are strange. Together, they form a shape we've been trying not to see, because if reality allows information to exist independent of matter, if the universe doesn't enforce a fixed here and there, if consciousness can, under the right conditions, slip between states, then Gil Perez isn't a mystery from the past. He's a preview. And here's the part that should make you uneasy. Science didn't explain his story. It caught up to it. For centuries, we assumed the universe was stable, rigid, continuous, a smooth fabric stretching unbroken from one moment to the next a place where things stay where they are, unless something forces them to move. But that isn't the universe physics is describing anymore. In the modern picture, reality is a negotiation, a dynamic contract between information, observation, and possibility. Most of us never notice this because our consciousness remains locked in its default state, coherent, consistent, anchored, but fatigue cracks it, trauma cracks it, meditation cracks it, dissociation cracks it. And when the anchor slips, the system can choose another valid configuration, another pattern, another location, not because the person travels, but because the universe does. This is the part nobody says out loud, not the physicists, not the mystics, not the historians. Teleportation was never about technology. It was about constraints. Constraints on information, constraints on coherence, constraints on what a conscious system can or cannot select as its next state. Kyoto didn't invent teleportation. They just built the first instrument precise enough to reveal the rules of a game reality has been playing since long before we had words for it. Rules that folklore stumbled into by accident. Rules mystics described through metaphor. Rules that terrified the people who lived through them look back at the pattern. A blink, a slip, a moment where the self falters and the world reconfigures. Gil Perez wasn't transported. He was resolved into a different solution of the same equation. And here's the question the world will have to face whether it wants to or not. If reality can choose a different version of itself in the presence of a disrupted observer, how often has it done that without anyone noticing? Because maybe the universe isn't stable. Maybe it's just stable enough until it isn't. And maybe, just maybe, history's strangest stories weren't warnings of the impossible. 
Maybe they were early drafts of the truth.